Thank you, Catherine, and thank you everyone for coming. A few weeks ago, I was sat down, just there, in those pews where you are now, helping some of our project clergy and church wardens to record a video about their experiences, which you can watch in the village hall over lunch. Christine, hello, Christine, <laughs> who is one of the church wardens from the coastal cluster, said something like, when I agreed to become a church warden, I didn't realize how much was involved with the buildings. I felt clueless. Now, Christine is an accomplished person, like many church wardens are. She'd noticed that there was no toddler group in her village, so she decided to set one up in the parish rooms, and it's being run by the parents now. She made contact with mental wellbeing groups she'd noticed walking in the area, and invited them to shelter in the church buildings during their lunch breaks. And together with other people in her congregation, she raised the funds to build a small extension to one of her churches and install a toilet. But still, she'd felt clueless about caring for the church buildings. Her parish has three church buildings to care for, a tin tabernacle, a former fisherman's mission, and a grade one listed church, which dates back to at least Norman times. It's a huge amount to expect of volunteers to have the knowledge, skills, time, and finances to care for these diverse buildings, even for folk as resourceful as these ones are. It's these people, the ones who are on the ground, in the communities, doing the work, who most needed help from RCFE. But keep listening, because I think they aren't the only ones we managed to help to get clued up from the bottom up. During 2022, Rural Churches for Everyone has worked intensively with 30 rural church buildings in Newcastle Diocese across four clusters, each with one priest serving multiple churches and parishes. In your handout pack, you should have this, which has got a map. I'm going to be referring to this through the speech, so speech talk. So these, these are the 30 ch uh, churches in the four clusters that we've been working with this year. Is the sound okay? Yeah, it's, it's very echoey here. Um, so RCFE employed me as a consultant in 2020 alongside a project manager Philippa Carter, who I think you all know, has been here in that role since last autumn. And Eleanor Johnson, do you want to say? Eleanor Johnson, who is one of her predecessors. And we've also got um, Pam Walker, who was one of her other predecessors. Um, Eleanor is now working for um, the Church's Conservation Trust as the Regeneration Officer in the Northeast. So that's Eleanor. You might need to talk to her at lunchtime. <laughs> Um, we were recruited to support the clergy and PCCs to take a collaborative approach to determining a sustainable future for each of their buildings. We chose that community development approach so they were able to build networks within their clusters and plan together how their church buildings might collectively serve the needs of their many audiences, whilst also conserving their cultural heritage and meeting their environmental obligations. So this time last year, Philippa and I braved the debris of Storm Arwen and visited all 30 of the churches and met clergy and church wardens, listening to their concerns and aspirations, with Philippa waving her theoretical magical wand to discover what their three wishes were for each of the buildings. Prior to that, during lockdowns, the project funding received from the National Lottery Heritage Fund paid for my time to explore and collate recent research into church buildings from a variety of sources, and I've applied this to what we learned from the cluster teams about their needs, their communities, and their deep rural context. Then, during the spring and early summer this year, Philippa and I delivered three workshops in each cluster, which supported PCC members to take a deeper look at their own parish circumstances and to better understand their problems and begin to formulate some aspirations. This helped them to realize that they have issues in common across their cluster. Then, um, they then grasp the chance to work together, deciphering ways they might support each other to surmount their problems, sharing their workload and finding a comrade or two to collaborate with. 
Over this past summer, Philip has been coordinating a series of specialist training sessions with expert input from the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, also known as SPAB, on church maintenance, Professor David Petz from Durham University's Belief in the Northeast Project, who will be revisiting his talk in the after lunch breakout session, Capturing the Heritage of Your Church. We've got Duncan Wise from Northumberland National Park, who delivered a session on creating walk routes. Northumberland Wildlife Trust delivered a session on managing your churchyard for wildlife and biodiversity. And we had sessions from grant funders and about champing too. And there's recordings of those online sessions available on the project web pages. And lastly, with invaluable guidance from the Rural Strategy Group, and particularly the individual project clergy, thank you, especially to them, Philippa and I developed resources to help PCCs undertake robust assessment of their church buildings, embedding that research um, comparative across a cluster or benefice, deanery or even diocese, the process helped our volunteers and clergy to define and articulate their ambitions into a plan of action so they are ready to ask for the help they need from the area dean, their archdeacon, partner organisations, parishioners and funders. So I want to turn now to some of the themes that emerged during that project. The first one is about parish statistics. You need the top um, table for this one. This table shows just how thinly spread our rural churches are, compared to not only the rest of the Newcastle Diocese, but also the rest of England. The figures speak for themselves, but there's three things I want to point out. One is that the pool of people we have to recruit for members of, uh, for PCC members and church wardens from, for each church, are between seven and 17 times smaller than the average parish population. Our priests have to serve parishioners in geographic areas that are between eight and 67 times larger than the average for England. And some priests are caring for nine church buildings, most of which are listed, and are also supporting six PCCs, if those PCCs exist. And the third thing is that our congregations are a half to a fifth the number, but as a proportion of parishioners, they're significantly larger, sometimes over double, double. And you'll hear Robin Dower, the church warden for Cambo, talking about this in the video over lunch. Next table, the one at the bottom of that page. We're looking at parish parishioners' well-being data here. This data table is compiled, um, the data in this table is compiled by the co-op as in the cooperative who have the shops, but also do a lot for um, mutual uh, uh, social enterprises. And I've included the web address, I think. Yes, um, so that you can see where they have got the data from and also to find out the equivalent information for your own parishes. At the moment, it's relying on the 2011 census data because it hasn't been released at the granular level yet, but I'm imagining it will be updated as, as that goes, as that's released. And the rest of the data is dated October 2021. They assessed each postcode area for nine well-being characteristics. And some of our church wardens were surprised at the figures for their clusters during the workshops that we ran. We went into more granular detail for each of their clusters and each of the churches in those. They felt that this was very different from the people that they knew in their communities and congregations. But this data is backed up by information from the NHS, the Office for National Statistics, Historic England, etc., etc. So while many of the factors they consider aren't things that our church buildings could affect, like, for example, the distance to the nearest train station or hospital, what they do show is the established needs that your parishioners have. And there may very well be things which can be done in and through your church buildings to help alleviate them. So from that data set that you've got, you can see that in RF, RCFE, our highest scores are for environment. Our communities live in and care for outstanding protected landscapes rich in wildlife and history. We have a national park, two AOMVs, national trust estates, and a capability-brown-designed capability landscape. 
Even though many have got poor housing, the landscapes are of such high quality, they skew the score. Our communities scored below the UK average in six of the eight wellbeing criteria, with some particularly low scores for health and connectivity. There are extremes of inequality within our clusters, and that's shown by the column of range. The average range in the UK is eight, and our average for RCFE clusters as a whole was 46. And our parishioners have a shared experience of remoteness from almost all public services, shops, schools, theatres, libraries, good broadband, healthcare, railways, even dual carriageways. Additionally, one of our project partners, the Centre for the Rural Economy at Newcastle University, completed a study during lockdown which demonstrated that more than half of rural residents are financially vulnerable. There's a link to the research later in the handout. So even though RCFE clusters scored within the UK range, average range, um, for economy, if you look at the detail, the Coastlands cluster, with its large tourism industry compared to the others, skewed the average score, and the other three clusters are lower, below the UK range. However, the research also demonstrates the areas are characterised by an interdependence which remains essential to local resilience, as demonstrated during the pandemic lockdowns and the 12-day power outages and water supply stoppages after Storm Arwen, when the emergency services came to the church wardens to ask who they should talk to, who is at risk, who should we focus on first. The research also shows that developing narratives about place and their culture can bring optimism and hope. Like being part of the International Dark Sky Park, or the Northumbrian innovators here in Kirk Welpington with Charles Parsons and Lady Parsons, up the road at Cambo with the Trevelyan and Dower families, and down the road at Kirk Hall with Capability Brown. If you watch out for Kitty from Kirk Hall in the lunchtime video, she talks about that. The next theme is that we worked in partnerships, and we'll explore these further in one of the breakout sessions after lunch. But the most effective partnerships are those that have been developing between the PC mem PCC members within each cluster and also with our project partners. So much so that already Louise Curry and Andy Dean from Community Action Northumberland, I think are here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the back. Um, and they've recognised five churches as community buildings and have included them within their solar panel pilot and to be members of their new community benefit society. And hopefully that will roll out if it's successful next year. The Northumberland Coast, A and B, is Sarah here? No, Sarah wouldn't know. No? Can't see her. Um, the Northumberland Coast IRMB have included £100,000 of accessibility improvements to three of our church buildings, plus another one from just outside RCFE, in their Coastlands National Lottery Heritage Fund bid, which was submitted last August. And other churches are developing productive partnerships with the Northumberland National Park and North Pennines IRMB, looking at improving facilities for tourists and locals alike. Timeliness was the next theme. So RCFE was originally meant to end in June 2021, and we're grateful that the National Lottery Heritage Fund allowed us to extend the project until next week. <laughs> um, uh, spreading the grant more thinly, appropriately enough, over a longer period of time. But the hiatus due to the pandemic meant that we were able to make use of... Um, the swathe of very pertinent research which has been published recently. One of the refrains we heard early on in the project was that there was no guidance from the Church of England nationally about church buildings. Well, there is now. So if you have a look at the next page on your handout, looks like this, lots of links. This is a list of most of the research that I used to... Um, uh, to inform the work of the project. So not only do we have the commitment to reaching net zero by 2030 and all the associated reductions in costs, increases in warmth, 
But we also have the excellent CV Environment Programme, online training and their practical path to net zero carbon checklist, which is highly recommended, it's very good. We've got Joe Elders here from the Church Buildings Council down in London. Thanks for coming all the way up, Joe. And they, they published their study into struggling, closed and closing church buildings in 2020. And in that, they define a struggling church as that category of church buildings which, for one reason or another, or for a combination of reasons, are in difficulty and where there is a concern as to their sustainability as local centres of worship and mission. Their communities may, as a result, decide to set in motion the closure process or to embark on a process of more or less radical change in order to maintain regular public worship in them. You might wonder if your church fits this definition, but we felt that all 30 of other RCFE churches currently do. The Church Buildings Council website states that the overall aim is for our church buildings to be open and sustainable. Yet their report says that the Church of England is currently undergoing the biggest reduction in its church building stock since the Reformation in the 16th century. The church commissioners said in 2021 that over 2,000 church buildings have been closed since 1969, about 12% of the frontline estate. As a result, the church commissioners are reviewing the 2011 mission and pastoral measure, which is going to the General Synod in February 2023 to make it easier for PCCs to take a life cycle approach to church buildings, encouraging them to make wider, more imaginative and more strategic use of your church building, opening it up to all in your community and giving new people new reasons to cross the threshold. This is supplemented by research into the social impact of places of worship by the National Churches Trust, the Archbishop of York's Grace Project, which was delivered by Theos and the Church Urban Fund, and by Historic England and the National Lottery's work. And much of this is, was shown into sharp relief during the pandemic. My favorite quote from the National Churches Trust House for Good report is, the impact of COVID-19 has made the social value of churches even more relevant. Church buildings are the key places where we will start to rebuild our communities. Our church buildings are already embedded in every community and they each have a band of people attached to them who are motivated to care for every person living in their parish. They are an obvious place for restorative social action to grow from. The Growing Good report also identified the five church characteristics consistent with congregations that are growing spiritually and numerically through their engagement in social action. Um, and the importance of these five characteristics will become apparent surely, as being, which, um, as being those which promote meaningful relationships through presence, perseverance, hospitality, adaptability and participation. Lastly, we found we have much more in common and sets us apart. So common issues for churches in each cluster at the start of the project included the oversupply of church buildings. There was as many as eight or nine overseen by one priest or in charge, many listed, serving very sparse and small populations, and with a little additional ministry available, like retired priests or readers. Feelings amongst volunteers were that they felt burdened, clueless, abandoned, alone, and disillusioned. Their direct quotes, especially during the 12 month or longer clergy vacancies that two of our clusters experienced. Volunteers and clergy were unaware of the research and initiatives happening at a national level to address the needs of struggling churches. And there were low levels of capacity and confidence about how to work within complex ecclesiastical and historic environment legislation such as the church representation rules, mission and pastoral measure, but also the Equalities Act and the listed building consent. And as a result, there's a high risk of many church buildings having no one left to manage them in the near future. There was also a shared experience in people's response to the pandemic. The restrictions of lockdowns shifted people's attitudes towards change. They became less resistant, discovering that things could be done well and differently, 
It also helped them reflect on what really matters to people, what they valued about their church buildings, such as the persistence in a community, the solace they found in the memories held in the buildings, and the place they create amid life's troubles for reflection and connection. The final area of commonality was the fifth mark of mission, striving to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of, it, of the earth. The General Synod commitment to reaching net zero carbon by 2030 accepted the scientific consensus and raised the urgency of energy efficiency beyond saving money and keeping congregations warm in winter. The storms of last winter, which caused the power cuts and the water supplies to fail in many of our villages, also brought the need for inter interdependence and local resilience literally to our doorsteps and in some cases through our roofs. The, number, the summer was marked by a growing awareness of the biodiversity crisis and the need to care for creation and the advantages of an open, cool and shady community building, like a church, has begun to be recognised during the heat waves of last summer. So on the next page, I've got a diagram that kind of um, attempts to show you where our CFE sits. So on the left, we've got all the advice, all the needs, and all the requirements from the various different things um, and organisations which are put onto the PCC's church wardens, volunteers and clergy of rural churches. And we're hopeful that the, the toolkits that we've got developed for you will help you work with your deanery development groups and then to your Archde uh, through the Archdeacon of Lindisfarne to get to the point where you've got a five-year plan for going forward. And I've made notes below that which kind of explain the process that we went through. <clears throat> and remind you, the Church Building Council website states that the overall aim is for our church buildings to be open and sustainable. Luckily, they've published what that means with eight criteria, four for open and four for sustainable. And they're on the next page for you. This page. So you're all there? So during the um, workshops that we had in each of the clusters, we spent a lot of time working with the PCC members to develop our understanding of what these eight criteria mean. We looked at research. We had a lot of interesting discussions with each other. And we looked at um, approaches that we could take and issues that we're experiencing that mean that these are issue, uh, problems for us or maybe we're, we're really good at some of these things. And how could we share our knowledge and skills? What emerged through those processes of workshops is that a lot of this was based on opinion. It wasn't robust. So people didn't feel confident that what they were talking about was valid. So we developed a tool which is this, which is also in your pack. Oops. Sorry, just disappear. Um, this is the open and sustainable 101 questions, a checklist for your church. So you don't need to read all 101 questions now. Um, those of you, some of the church wardens who took part in this will have um, had a look at this earlier in the process. That was an earlier iteration. This is um, a, the, the current iteration of it. So there'll be some changes from anything that you've seen earlier. So there are 101 questions on the checklist, each of which is allocated to one of the open and sustainable criteria. It's organized to make it easy for volunteers, like the church wardens and PCC members, to answer the questions in the location where they are relevant, i.e. approaching from the pavement, inside the church, in the churchyard, and when you're online, or when you're in a PCC meeting. So once, how this works is you would look at each of those questions, answer them honestly, which is the key point. You need to be truthful with yourself here. And the current yes answers and potential within five years and need research answers scores for each of the criteria, you total them all up 
and um, turn them into a percentage at the end. On the back, towards the back, there's like a, a table to help you do this calculation. So each criteria would then be given the traffic light rating for the church using the uh, thresholds, which are at the bottom of that part of your handout. And they're also in the checklist. Um, and we then weighted those uh, criteria to favour those which contribute to those five key characteristics that came out of the Growing Good report. So the, the um, persistence, hospitality, uh, I can't remember the rest of the top of my head, um, adaptability, etc. The weighted percentages for the current and aspirational scores were then given that traffic light rating using the thresholds in the handout. So in the guidance from the CBC, they say that every diocese should review each of their church buildings every five years and give them a traffic light rating. They didn't say what the traffic light rating was or how you worked it out, so we created our own. Um, but because this was our first iteration, we also added the black score in to show those churches which were really struggling and really needed urgent and serious intervention. Um, and in later iterations, in five years' time, we may not need, hopefully, we will not need that black, um, that black rating. I don't really want to go through and read everything that I've already written down, so I'll leave you to digest that, and I'll happily answer questions later about it if you want. But I want to take you through a worked example. So this is using one of our clusters, but I've anonymized it, anonymized it. And you've got the graphs of the results in your handout. Again, I'll wait till you all find the page. So it's this one. The top one says worked example, Example cluster, ONS 101 scores by criteria. I'll wait till the rustling stops so I know everybody's got the right page. Okay, so this graph shows the current ranking, which is the bottom part of each of the bar, and the potential ranking for the top part, which is the top part of each bar. So the bottom, the current ranking, the bottom part of the bar is those answers that the churches gave, yes, or we currently do this. And the top part is that we need to research this, or we want to do this, but we're not quite there yet, we'll be, but we will do it within the next five years. Um, and it's organised by the criteria. So O1 is uh, unlocked, O2 is welcoming, O3 is collaboration, O4 is accessible, S1 is environmental, S2 is conservation, S3 is socially, and S4 is economically. And then the weighted average is at the end. It's not a total, it's an average. Now, this shows that collectively... The cluster needs to focus on improving criteria O2, welcome, O3, collaborative, O4, accessible, S1, environment, and S4, economic, but particularly S3, socially. Only minor actions are needed in O1, unlocked, and O3, conservation, to get into the green zone within five years. However, if the cluster completes all of their aspirational actions in these criteria, they have collectively the potential to become both open and sustainable, like the CBC want, within that five-year review period. As for the economic criteria, remains an area of concern for the future. The second uh, graph on that page is the same cluster, but worked by church rather than by criteria. So you can see there are nine churches in this cluster. And of those nine churches, um, three of them are in the black, three of them are in the red, and three of them are in the amber. But all bar one 
have got the potential with their plans to get into the green within five years. So the three black ranked churches need advice from their archdeacon. And in reality, the clergy and the congregation have got really good ideas for a life cycle approach to those three buildings. Three other church buildings in the red need some external support, although they've got the ideas, they don't have the capacity to realize them on their own. The three remaining churches are still struggling and need some support from the deanery and each other to achieve their aspirations. They're the amber ones. So I'll give you an idea of some of the um, actions that they're planning to take. So collectively, what this came out with was that, that there's actually a lot of actions that they want to do together. Everybody wants to do them. So that's thing like, things like improving the online information and engagement on social media, installing card and online donations, exploring the feasibility of contracting a paid bookkeeper for the whole cluster to manage the account, completing the practical path to net zero for each church and completing the actions. If you think about it, we want to do a, a ground source heat pump that's a lot of research that's needed. If there's four churches wanting to do that, you can share the load and, um, and share your research together to do that. Um, they want to create building maintenance volunteer groups to complete the SPAB Faith in Maintenance Baseline Survey and to work together to clear the gutters safely because you need somebody at the top of the ladder and at the bottom of the ladder to do that. Create churchyards for wildlife volunteer group and develop programs of works using Caring for God's Acre or Eco Church schemes. Work with their local heritage centre to interpret the local history in these community buildings. Complete the Growing Good toolkit, which came out of the Archbishop of York's Grace Project, to better understand their community's needs. Work together to attain the Aspire Award for church administration. This is something that um, Community Action Northumberland have developed with the project. And that was the one area where there was no real, um, what should we do? How should we be doing it? Where's the guidelines? Where's the toolkit? So I'd encourage you all to have a look in your, in your packs. There should be a flyer or a leaflet about the Aspire Award, which was developed through the project. And also contribute to their deaneries, development groups, subgroups, to develop this five-year review cycle in their mission and ministry planning and also in reviewing their buildings. But on top of that, Church A decided they wanted to develop, to develop animal-themed activity, welcoming pets, livestock and wildlife, champing for Pennine Way walkers which walk past their gate, and stargazers who use the International Dark Sky Park. Church B wanted to explore a peace and reconciliation role working with veterans groups, but also the historic figures who are associated with the church. Church C wanted to move services to the village hall, look at ecumenical collaboration, explore remembrance themes with the military. Church D wanted to interpret the, the history of their valley and develop evidence of community need for planned reordering. Church E wanted to remove themselves from the Heritage at Risk Register, develop ecotherapy activity with neighbouring businesses and youth organisations. Church F wanted to develop partnerships with local conservation organisations to support their work. Um, church G wanted to improve the welcome, signage, seating in the churchyard, encouraging visitors to use the space. Church H wanted to merge PCCs and become a festival church on a pilgrimage route. And Church I, which was in the same parish as Church H, um, wanted to be considered for closure to sell for housing, perhaps, to part fund the other works in the cluster. None of this is set in stone. These are ideas that need to be developed through the next five-year programme to see if they work. But by articulating them in this way, we've got an evidence base and a strategy document to go to funders, to go to the archdeacon, to go to the deanery development groups and go, this is what we want to do, or this is what we think we want to do. Please, can you help us? The next and final sheet of your handout looks like that. The top graph shows the current ranking 
for the 30 church buildings within the four RCFE clusters. We've classed all of these church buildings as struggling. You can see there's no greens there. But some of them are in a much more challenging position than the others. Almost a third of the buildings need intervention from the diocese and will be referred to the Archdeacon for triage. Half the buildings are in need of external support to become open and sustainable. This may be from local agencies such as CAN, Community Action Northumberland, or the Protected Landscape Partners, or by approaching other partners identified through the Growing Good Toolkit, for example. A fifth, the remaining fifth of the churches do need assistance, but perhaps by working together to share the burden, using online advice like the CV Environment Programme, or just talking amongst themselves within their, um, within their communities that comes out of the, the work that they've done through this process. The bottom graph shows the potential ranking for the 30 church buildings within the four RCFE clusters if all of the aspirational actions are completed successfully within that five-year review period. It would be amazing if that happened, but I think it's possibly quite unlikely that all of them will manage to do that. Four of the buildings remain of serious concern in the Black Rake ranking, showing that there is very scant potential for improvement to be made. These could be considered for referral to DMPC. One church still has a red rank, and that's because there's a shift in the PCC underway which may alter the capacity for change, so there's a lot of uncertainty around that particular building. Six churches are making good progress towards becoming open and sustainable, but it might take them longer than five years to get there, and they'll need ongoing support going forward. The remaining 19 church buildings have got the potential to become both open and sustainable within those five years, if they are supported to complete all of their um, aspirational actions. So the outcomes of the RCFE project are that PCCs can easily produce a robust assessment of current status of their individual church buildings, which is comparative across their cluster or deanery. Deaneries can agree mutual approaches to common issues, like buildings maintenance, encouraging wildlife, net zero carbon, joint commissioning of services and utilities, using relevant toolkits for specific topics, Growing goods, stewardship, eco church. I think that was something that really came out of the workshops and the online sessions was that people talking about these things together and discussing the questions actually really developed the networks that they've got within their clusters and between the individual churches. And that's where this strength and hope that Catherine was talking about before came from. It generated that op op optimism for feeling less alone, less burdened less disillusioned. Deaneries, PCCs and congregations have a better understanding of the CBC approach to struggling churches and their role within it. The feelings of disillusionment and isolation reduced, burdens were shared and renewing of hope and purpose in mission. They have an evidenced and actionable five-year plan developed by each church PCC and collated to inform the cluster benefits deanery mission and ministry action planning with a schedule for review, importantly. They've got improved understanding of the eight open and sustainable criteria for the church buildings, with deaneries, PCCs and congregations working together to achieve them. PCCs feel empowered to make good decisions so that their cluster of church buildings can better serve the needs of the PCCs themselves, but also the congregations, the parishioners, visitors and communities of interest. The diocese is better able to support clergy and PCCs to manage their church buildings because they've got evidence-based decisions and solutions to discuss. Five yearly church buildings review process has begun and with one of our clusters, the Moreland Group, didn't go through the process, this process five years ago, but they did make similar sorts of decisions. And the process that they've, the experience that they've had has highlighted um, the areas where information flow needs to improve or processes need to be clarified within the diocese. Um, there's a greater proportion of retained church buildings classed as both open and sustainable by 2026, which means that they will become 
welcoming and accessible for a wide range of people, whatever their reason for visiting. Increasingly zero carbon, with churchyards abundant in wildlife and well used by people. Actively involved in the broad community life of their parishes, building their own social capital for support for the buildings and the church. Well managed community buildings that are adaptive to changing needs and circumstances in the parishioners they serve. And financially self sustaining and able to invest their resources where their mission and ministry priorities lie. I've got a few points for you to ponder, because this is a work in progress. Could the 101 checklist also be more useful, be useful in urban areas? Have we missed out any of your favourite tools, like the Growing Good Toolkits, the Practical Path to Net Zero? Did I miss anything in the research that I did? From the, uh, there's a list of all of the um, toolkits on the back page. How do we keep this relevant? For the next five years, we finish next week. How do we keep it relevant for the five-year review period? I put my um, email address on there at the end. If you've got any ideas, um, or if you know of anything that I've missed, please let me know. And I want to leave you with a request. Please, in the church, uh, in the village hall over lunchtime, watch the video during lunch to see if Christine and Robin and Kitty and the other church wardens and clergy feel that they have moved from clueless to clued up, from the bottom up. Now we're at the end of the project. Thank you for listening.